Hello, everyone. This is Megan. And this is Alana. And welcome to Tea Time Crimes. totally space like what do I say who am I I know I was like what's this dramatic pause <laughs> I was like what's the name of this podcast what's happening? <laughs> who am I you know <laughs> who am I all these existential questions just hit me so oh. hard good morning good afternoon good evening how are you I'm doing better than you yeah yeah I have COVID yeah. And we just finished the month long dog isolation. And we just, we were like, that was fun. And so now we're going to go into the COVID isolation. So my son and I have COVID and we're isolating from Brad. And it's been fun. Yeah. Yeah. COVID's a great time, huh? Yeah. I, we were out of town when we got it and I didn't realize we had it because uh, everybody we were with started getting a cold and my son and I got stomach bug. Apparently it can start like that. And then it ended for my son and it turned into the cold for me. So my voice is a little hoarse still and I'm definitely tired. It's a little sexy today. <laughs> is that what you call it? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever you just did was off the charts. So you can talk <laughs> like that more often. <laughs> oh God, I don't think I can do uh, that. Yeah. I, if you have, gosh, if you have COVID or you've just been doing this whole pandemic, this homeschooling or remote learning, oh, you're the superhero. Yeah, not fun. Or you're a nurse working in the ICU. Holy moly. I don't know how people, how people do it. We're on a full week of it and I didn't realize how sick I was. I was telling Alana and Brad, I didn't realize how sick I was because I just started kind of being aware of being in isolation for the last couple of days. I was so out of it. Yep. Wipes you out. Alana was telling me stuff and I don't even remember it. I know. She's like, prove it. And then I got, <laughs> we had this whole conversation. Not a whole conversation, but we did. It was just funny. Yeah. We had a couple of entire conversations. I said, you never told me that. She said, yes, I did. And then sent me the text <laughs> evidence. Oh, wow. <laughs> I totally, no memory of that. It's That's always scary. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so I feel okay now, just a hoarse voice, tired, and I like jogged down the hall, and that was not like to get something, not trying to yeah, jog. Yeah, it takes like, it Oof. out of you, man. I, I'm trying to remember. So it's been it's almost a year since my COVID anniversary. Oh, um, that's nice. Back in the Delta days variant. <laughs> the Delta days and... it sounds like a blues song. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was just like looking back, and it's I don't think like you can't exercise you can't do anything for maybe like two weeks and you start going for like walks and stuff and getting that capacity back but it's it beats you down even if you're vaccinated yeah and my my body it was you know I had laryngitis right before and then I had the surgery right before that so my body is I couldn't blow my nose because I have the stint in still I can't I was just actually I was thinking about that this morning or last night and I was just like I like the, the the way that makes me feel, just imagining that I want to die. Like yeah, that so sounds impossible. It's like when you have an itch that you can't get. So kind bad. Of. It's yeah, and your nose, and it just like do, would it just like leak out of your nose? I guess this is no. Of it just was all stuffy, and I couldn't blow my nose. Oh and my I God. had I, I tried a couple of times very lightly, and like air blew out my eye. <laughs> it's like some sort of weird stop cartoon. it. Oh, that no, that's happened. Ugh. We're going to just not mess with it because there's a stint in the it's eye terrible. through the nose, you know? When can you do, when you can blow your nose again? Um, I, I mean, until it's fully healed. I, I, I'll hopefully get the stint removed at the end of the month. Good Lord. And the yeah, end of next month or this month? Yeah. End of August. Ugh, it's still a while. Oh, my tea's ready. Okay. And we're back. Good Lord, you were gone forever. So tell us about your tea for today. 
I, I am so excited. So one of our special listeners, not sure if they want to be identified or not. That's but, so um, weird. <laughs> what? One of our loyal followers. One of our special listeners. <laughs> <laughs> they sent me an amazing whole kit. So it came with a mug. Ooh. It came with like the actual tea, loose leaf tea that you, it's instructions. That's why it took so long this morning is because you have to boil it. You have to make it, add milk, boil that, strain it. Just describe making tea. Yeah. Steep it, everything. Well, I feel like that's pretty standard. Is, I don't know if you boil your tea normally, but that was another level. Um, oh, came with oh. stickers, a strainer, and it even stickers? came with. Yeah, it says "Get rich or try trying," and I love it. Oh my it. gosh! I... No, it's a whole kit. I'll post it. Thank you so wow. much to that listener. That was really, really special. Chai is one of my could be my favorite tea besides the Irish breakfast. I always go for a chai. I'm really excited. It also came with these cookies. What are they called? Oh yeah, you can't, you can't read it. How do you say uh, the, that? The listener, the listeners can't read it. Parla G. And I feel like those of you who listen from Los Angeles, if you've ever been to Badmash, I feel like you might get this cookie at as a dessert. Badmash also has a nasty chai in a good way. Are you going to eat it? I was thinking about eating it with it because it came with it. What do you feel about okay, that? Okay, yeah. I, I think that's great, but open it now because otherwise yeah, you're going to be gonna trying be to open that wrapper time. for the next 60 minutes. It's going to be crinkle fest <laughs> 2022 over yeah, here. Yeah, it is. It is what? It, here's some ASMR. No, oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm really getting that target audience. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Here it is. Okay. It's, a, it's a little biscuit, and it says bar- Parley G. Like an English biscuit, if you imagine that. Yeah. It looks like a digestive. It's Yeah, it smell, it, that's exactly what it smells like, and I think it's perfect to have with tea. All right. Well, you going to try this tea? Or? Okay. Are we ready? I was sniffing it earlier. Oh, my God. Yeah. So it's chai tea with milk? Oh, it smells really good. <laughs> oh. Oh, whoa. I just went on a roller coaster. <laughs> okay, also, though, I told you as I was making it, I read tablespoon instead of teaspoon. So I actually doubled the uh, serving, so it's very strong. So I may be a little Ooh. hopped up for this podcast. Oh God, help! Well, you bring the energy uh, today, but you can you can go all the way through the chai, right from the, the <laughs> first <laughs> sip, the first taste of the black tea, through the cardamom, ginger. I mean, the other leaves in here, it it's beautiful, and the mix is beautiful too. I could show you that as well, but. Give us a body count. Oh, it's a full one. It's a body. You can just grab onto it. Yikes. Yeah, so I, this is two thrusting thumbs up. This is my cup Whoa. of tea. You've never had both thumbs in the mix. I know, I know, but I, this is, this is exactly what I love. Wow. It's like, it's a homemade chai. You know, it has all of the bits and pieces, not just from a tea bag. It's all the actual herbs and cardamom wow. and all that stuff. Our special listener knocked it out of the park. Yeah. So I'm going to check out this company, Kolkata Chai Co., because they know how to do it. And also they have stickers and they're funny. So and what, they give it cookies. sounded like gibberish. What did, what's the name Kolkata. of the company? Kolkata. So I think it's kind of a play on Kolkata, which is in India. K-O-L-K-A-T-A. Oh, well, I don't know. Some people don't know. <laughs> What if geography. the five-year-old's listening to this? They I just gave them be. a geography lesson. Yeah, Put they parental be. controls on your podcast. I think I want to know when there's made it. Yeah, it's, these cookies are made in India. Oh, no. We're going to have to hear you snap it and crunch it <laughs> through the hole. I'll be over here. Oh, that helps. Yeah. It does, it, I, I don't know when you you're going to learn. You, yeah, of course. You pulling away from your microphone doesn't help. It just makes the noise more muffled and we oh. can still hear it. Just get it right up in there. Just oh, full nice. experience. It's nice. This is this is this is so great. I'm just really. Do happy you dip right your now. cookies? I just did. <gasps> yeah, it broke. Part of it fell in. 
Well, get your teaspoon. I don't have it. It's okay. It's fine. Oh my gosh. Your face. All right. Two thrusting thumbs. You've never, ever, ever given such an emphatic review. Yeah. It's, I'm thrilled. Wow. All right. Cool. All right. Well, I researched this story right before I got sick and then got sick. So <laughs> perfect. And then you got COVID brain and caught yeah. in the fog. Yeah. I'm going to do my best. I'll do my best to be earmuff great. you too. Oh, God. Uh, no, it won't be too much. I'm just, I'm just trying to be considerate. Okay. Thank yeah, you. No, 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 Appreciate no. It. It, it's, it's not like that. Okay. So today we're going to talk about Ruth Finley. All right. All right. Mm-hmm. Now, Ruth was born Ruth Smock, February okay. 1st, 1930. Like a smock you'd In Missouri. Wear. Yes, like a smock you'd wear. Like maybe she was a painter. She wasn't, but yep, that's oh. the right right word. Her father was a struggling farmer and her mother worked from home. And when Ruth was just 15, she actually left home to go to Fort Scott, Kansas, which sounds like it's really far, but it's just across the border. So it was maybe 20 minutes from her What house. year is this? This is in the, in the 1940s, so 1945 She's wow. when she was 15. And she went so that she could take classes that weren't offered in her hometown. She got a job at the telephone company and she was taking classes for typing and sewing because classes like that weren't offered. Oh, okay. It's really practical okay, so, stuff. Yeah. So she's really responsible and she lived in a boarding house. Okay. How is that? Now, uh, what's a boarding house? And I said, how, how was it? You know, I feel like boarding houses could be terrible or good. At least there's no chamber pots at this time of year. I mean... This time of the year, you keep doing that. <laughs> well, in the fall, the chamber pots are put up. <laughs> you do not want to use a chamber pot in the summer. Let me tell you that. Yeah, seriously. But uh, on October 14th of 1946, so at this point, Ruth is 16. Ruth returns from the store, and she's in her, her room, and she's unpacking groceries. She hears a sound behind her. It's the sound of the, the sliding door opening up, and a man comes into her room. No. He attacks her from behind. (gasps) All she knows is that he's a white man in overalls who's about 50. She doesn't know who he is. Oh, my God. Ruth is a fighter, so she's able to kind of like twist her body and she jabs her attacker in the eyes with her thumbs. Brilliant. Another soft spot. This is my girl. There you go. Add it to your list. (laughs) This enrages him, though, and he takes a rag doused in chloroform and he stuffs it in her mouth and she passes out so he was ready when she wakes up he was burning the inside of her thighs with a flat iron what yeah now i'm not sure the details of the attack nobody went into them but she survived it it seemed like he ran off after that she survived it and she goes back to her parents house to recover and she does her best to move on after this weird, creepy, terrifying what attack. What the hell? Like, so he was just like sitting in her, you know, he's like waiting for her to get in her room and then creeped in and was ready with chloroform. Yeah. So I think Jeez. what ended, I think why he did that is because he, he said something along the lines of he was going to, because she went for his eyes. He said something along the lines of he was going to make it so nobody would want to look at her. Like he was trying to scar her. But it was just first degree burns, so it did. Bro, I you it did. attacked her first of all. You don't. I don't think we're. I don't think this. You know, full deck of cards. Rational here. dude. Yeah. So Ruth survives the attack, and she tries. Just wants to move on with her life, and she does her best to create this life that's you know an everyday kind of life. So she marries okay. a man named Ed Finley, who is sounds fantastic, by the way. He's two years older than her. He's an accountant. They. She works at the phone company still. They move to Wichita, Kansas, and they have two sons, and they have just this middle-class, content, happy, like happily boring life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Which is exactly what she wants. So when both Ed and Ruth are in their later 40s, in the late 70s, 1977 actually, Ed is out working in the backyard, and he collapses. Oh, no. Ruth is terrified that he suffered a heart attack, so she rushes him to the hospital, of course. 
And Ed is like, is just her world, you know, Ed and the, her two sons are her entire world. So she stays life. there waiting for all the test results or running him through this and that. The doctors aren't sure exactly what happened, but there's nothing more that anybody can do, But he, and he's stable. So they tell Ruth to go home, get some rest, and once they get yeah. the results of the test, you know, they'll know more and, and they can go from there. So Ruth And they'll goes keep home. him overnight. Right. He has to stay overnight right. for observations and until the test results come right. back and they know exactly what's happening. So Ruth goes home. Now, Ruth is not accustomed to being home alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as he's an accountant, it's not like he's traveling for work or anything. Yeah, it sounds like the two of them are together all the time. They have their nine to five, and then they're together all the time. Oh, I love them. They're pretty awesome. So she's not accustomed to being home alone, so she turns on the radio. But at this time in Kansas, the radio is inundated with updates on the BTK Strangler, who is a serial killer operating started operating in the 70s. <gasps> And by 1977, he's killed seven people. Oh. And so the airwaves are just inundated with that, which of course is not going to put you at ease, right? So Ruth is – she switches it to something else and she's trying – Turn the radio off. She's trying just to, you know, relax. Come, I'm sure she's got some adrenaline rush going from the day. She's trying to just come down from it all, relax, and and then just get some rest. The phone rings – while she's switching stations and that of course gives her another spike of adrenaline because she Spooks thinks it might her. be the hospital right it's yeah. a startling noise maybe there's news about Ed so she rushes to get it oh god i'm nervous a man's voice on the other end asks for Ruth Smock which is her maiden name her name now is Ruth Finley mm-hmm. and he asks for Ruth Smock from Fort Worth Kansas the man then <gasps> proceeds to read the newspaper article of Ruth's attack in 1946 what the fuck? Ruth acts like she she doesn't know what he's talking about, which is smart, right? That is super smart. Don't identify it. And the man threatens to blackmail her and says he needs money or he's <laughs> going what? to tell everybody. Oh, okay. You attacked people. He's going to spread the word about her. I don't know if it's the same man. He's just say I mean, he's just saying he's going to spread news or he's going to spread the word about this attack and let everybody know where she works and he knows where she works he mentions it yeah creepy ruth is freaked out and she hangs up the phone tries to just forget it as some kind of sick prank right yeah that'd be hard to forget though honestly i know i know ed they find out the next day that ed did not have a heart attack thank goodness there was something going on and from a previous injury so he has to stay in the hospital for a little bit no Luckily, no other calls happen while Ruth's alone and, and Ed's in the hospital. Okay. So, okay. again, she just sick prank some weirdo, found her out, and yeah. thought that that was funny when it was not. Later that summer, so this happened in June, later that summer, okay. Ruth is at work and she gets a letter, and mm. that letter is the original clipping of the article where Ruth was assaulted oh, as a would, teenager. I'd be so freaked out. Yeah, it that is so vicious. Also, I don't feel like it's a good it's a good threat. Like it's not a blackmail to me. It's not something you should be ashamed yeah. of. You know what I mean? Like she was attacked when she was a teenager. I know, it's not okay. her fault. The arrival of this article proves that one, he knows where she lives and he knows where she works because he knows her home phone number. He's called her and now she's gotten this. Dude. She starts to get prank calls repeatedly at home, but no, no, nothing more is said because the second Ruth says hello and realizes it's the man she hangs up, if Ed answers, the person just hangs up. Okay. Does, did she tell Ed about this? She did not. She didn't want to worry him. Oh, Ruthie. So August comes and goes and Ruth is out and about and a random man starts talking to her. He kind of asking her these weird questions and he approaches her on the street. Like out in town or something. Yeah, she's out running errands and she's headed back towards her car and this random guy just comes up to her and he starts talking to her, saying weird things like, hey, you worked hard at the phone company this week. Hey, you doing anything for the weekend? I'm going to Vegas. He's just, hey, I like the way you, like just being really strange, the things that he's saying and too familiar. Yeah. And Ruth tries to ignore him and just get to her car and he keeps talking to her. So she finally says, She's meeting her husband, which as women we know is a tricky do. 
And he ends the conversation by saying, I like your face. I'll see you again. You can count on that. Some people's fantasies are other people's nightmares. What the hell? Yeah. Yeah. Tell Ed and let's beat him up. She did tell Ed about that because it was so strange, but you have to kind of understand Ed's point of view. What do you what do you do with that? You have no idea who the man is. There's weirdo creeps on the street all the time. You know, he's definitely sympathetic, but he kind of just chalks it up to oh, – he doesn't know about the phone calls too, keep in mind. So he just chalks mm. it up to some weird random guy talking to his wife. So things kind of quiet down for the next year. Okay. All right. No more calls, nothing like that. But in June of 1978, Ruth is out in town again by herself, and she encounters that same man who she'd met the year before. He grabs her wrist (gasps) and yells at her, her to talk to him. So she, of course, twists away. We know she's a fighter. Twists away, yeah. runs into a department store and calls Ed. Ed had, had had no idea about anything except this man talking to her previously. He doesn't know about any of the calls. So he contacts the police this time. Yeah. I was about to say, let's move to but that step. again, there's nothing really they can do. A random guy grabbed her wrist on the street. Think, I mean, could we'll she We'll put our like, best guys on it. You know. Could she what? Play the flute? Uh, what are you doing? <laughs> She's making no, a weird... the, uh, sketch. A sketch like, artist, yeah. Uh, t- describe the guy and stuff and have but people the, look But the him. man didn't actually do anything. I mean, technically, isn't that a assault- uh, battery? I, I, if somebody I mean, grabs you, I don't know. I don't know what it is grabbing back someone's in the 70s either. wrist to talk to them, I'm not sure. But in that f- fall of that year, so in October, Ruth gets a letter in the mail this time it's filled with obscenities demanding money and saying they'll hurt her if she doesn't pay up so ruth and ed go to the police with this okay good and again that the serial killer the bt the btk strangler is still active and the police are actually really worried that ruth is on this guy's radar because he is known for sending letters to the media no. and, and things like that. And so they're really concerned that they don't know his MO or his his vibe well yeah. enough to know that it's not out of the realm that he just starts sending it to his intended victims, right? Man, they should like assign an officer to her when she's out in town. I know that's a little ridiculous, but if they had the resources. So every letter that Ruth gets, she starts getting them regularly. She brings it to the police. God, what a drain on your life. I know. Isn't that so scary? Initially, the spelling and grammar is pretty rough and kind of, it's kind of like chicken scratched. Not enough and, commas? No, I mean like words are spelled, not enough commas. Words are spelled wrong <laughs> and it's pretty, it's pretty vulgar language. You know, Gross. it's like pretty veiled or not veiled, pretty clear threats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And the phone calls start up again. Mm. Okay. So then- November 21st of 1978, Ruth is again in town. She's crossing the street and a car comes to a complete stop right in front of her. And the man she's encountered twice before jumps out of the back of the car, kicks Ruth in the shin, and throws her in the back seat. Oh, my God. Is this like on a main street? Are other people seeing this? Yes, it's on the main street. Another man is driving, but they done it so quick she's just nobody has noticed anything what and the man hits her over the head with what ruth described as like a piece of concrete i don't know why that was in the car but like a chunk of concrete hits her over the head probably for that reason (laughs) and she's doesn't go unconscious but she's immediately subdued kind of out of it uh yeah they drive around with ruth for hours just talking about what they're going to do They're going to rob her, and they're going to get rid of her, and all this stuff. Ruth finally says that she has to go to the bathroom. Nice. And they allow her to, but they take off her shoes and her jacket because it's November, right? It's chilly. Bro, still go for it. And at that moment, they they went through Ruth's purse, but she had her purse. They let her keep her purse, and she has mace in there. (laughs) 
So she <gasps> casually reaches in and grabs the mace, and then when they're outside, she uses the mace from her purse to spray the man that escorted her outside the car, and then she takes off running. Yeah, Ruth, go! It's cold, but she finds yeah. a spot in the park and she hides, and she can hear them calling for her. It must have felt like <laughs> forever. Like, well, well, I, I'm sorry, these guys I know. are like... Oh, Ruth, come back to the car. Well, I don't think they're like, Ruth, dear. I think they're like, they're, they, she can hear them looking for her. And yeah, like yeah, yeah. Saying like, oh, if you come out, we, you know, that kind of thing. Right, right, right. Now, Ruth had, this happened during the day and Ruth never returned to work. So her coworkers are, coworkers had already reported her missing. So Ed knows she's missing and he's frantic. Yeah, it's his baby girl. Uh, eventually, Ruth waits as long as she can stand to wait and she thinks it's probably safe and she runs to a nearby store for help. The men had robbed Ruth. They'd taken money from her and the police are seriously worried that, again, that Ruth might be some, have been somebody to seen the BTK strangler. They think maybe she's the only one who's seen him and this is part of his, some weird game he's playing. Right. So after this abduction, the letters keep coming and that kind of incoherent blackmail turns into these rhyming verses. And it's things like, no. yeah, it's things like, here's to you, my tender Valentine, red with blood and tied with twine. Nothing too much for a Valentine, gone from here by a whim of mine. Oh my God. So she's getting these poems in the mail i would move to another state i'm sorry i know they have the perfect life but it is not perfect anymore well obviously yeah i would say she would agree with you yeah so it (laughs) like these letters kind of stop and start then they stop for a little bit okay and then there's a break weird in august of 1979 so ruth is now she's been through it She's been getting phone calls. She's been getting Mm. blackmail letters. She's been getting things mailed to the office. She's been getting years now, right? Poems. Yeah, it started. The first call happened in seventy seven. It didn't really right hit like hit into gear until seventy eight. She's been abducted. Okay, she's terrified. Of course, she is terrified and living on edge every day. Yeah. Yeah. So in August of 1979, Ruth is out running errands by herself again. No. On the way to the car, a man surprises her again. He has a red bandana, some wire, and tape, and he tells Ruth to get in the car. Now, again, Ruth fights back, and this man stabs her three times. (gasps) Is it the same guy? On the, la- on the third stab, the man's hand slips from the blood, oh and Ruth's God. able to use that to push him and hop in the car. She locks the door, and she drives away with the weapon still in her side. Okay. She's amazing, first of all. But holy sh- Jesus. She drives to a gas station and calls for help from the gas okay. station. Probably the closest thing that was a little bit out of the way. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean she's high on adrenaline at this point. <laughs> and bleeding the, out. And she doesn't just call she doesn't just call like nine one one. She like dials a number that she knows from having dealt with the police so often Smart. in the last Good. few years. Get right to it. And gets somebody. They tell her to stay there, they'll send somebody out, and she says no way and she drives yeah. home. Wait. Shouldn't she go to the hospital? She's got stabbed three times. When she gets home, Ed Ed is, you know, comes out and sees <laughs> the horror it's like, and he Maybe he, we need to see a doctor. Yeah, you're not supposed to remove the we- a right. weapon, right? So he, like, they move her over, keep the weapon in place, and he drives her to the hospital. Jeez, Ruth is a badass. I'm sorry. So she'd been stabbed three times, and one of this one of the stabs had bruised a kidney. Ouch. So Ed, at this point, has named this guy the poet. Okay, that's what they, how they refer to him based off of his, you know. And so they are at the hospital and Ruth's under watch, right? The police are guarding her room. Yeah. I I mean, that's one of the safest places for her to be right now. 
And it's said that a man fitting the description that Ruth gave of this attacker actually came to the nurse's station and was turned away. Arrest him! Or at so least Ed, for questioning. Oh, come on, guys. Ed is feeling so helpless. You know, his, yeah. I mean, it must be so tense in the house. He starts taking out personal ads in the paper trying to lure the poet out and get him to kind of huh. – kind of entice him so he like posts these yeah. ads in the paper and the poet will sometimes respond really but it's just with gibberish like he i think he was hoping to maybe reveal some personal details or to kind of inflame the situation so he made a mistake but he just Got kind it. of answers with this nonsensical rhyming verse and nothing comes from it at this point like you said earlier police have cameras set up on the house and they monitor them regularly they're going okay, good. all out. Uh, the phone company has to come out and bury the Finley's telephone line because the, the phone line had been cut twice. What? Yeah. So they come out Damn. and they bury the line so that they, okay. people can't yeah. do that and it helps them be safe. Ed is driving Ruth. She's still going to work, but Ed is driving her to and from work. Makes sense. I mean, she's never alone now. So they've got cameras all on the backyard. She's Good. escorted. She's only at work or at home with Ed. And they have somebody monitoring it at all times. Ugh, but what kind of life is this? In January of 1980, Ruth is at work in a butcher knife wrapped in a red bandana, which you remember the red bandana mm -hmm. her attacker had when she was stabbed is sent to her work with a poem that says, Shut your eyes and think of the 12-inch blade. Will you remember the hole it made? Dream of me and obey my commands. Think of me with a knife in my hands. Ew. Yeah. If that doesn't ruin Ugh. your day, I don't know what will. I don't know why they haven't moved at this point. I mean, he could just find her. Her whole life is there. Why her. should she have to move? I know. I know, it sucks. So letters like that just keep coming. And he also starts to escalate and contact local businesses in town regarding Ruth. And what I mean by that is, for example, he would contact the funeral home, letting them know that Ruth would need his service, their services shortly. Bro, that's a threat. Yeah. And at this time, the BTK strangler is still on the loose. Hmm. And the behavior starts to escalate. So now things are being left in the Finley's front yard. Gross things. Jar oh, of God. urine, feces, Ew. Molotov Ew. cocktails, shards of glass. Around Christmas time, Ruth and Ed are downstairs. They have like a family room, you know, mm -hmm. like in the basement and they're watching a Christmas movie. And they hear a loud explosion and Ed runs upstairs and somebody has lit the Christmas wreath on their door on fire and it exploded, what? broke the glass. Jeez. And Ed is able to put the fire out very quickly, but I mean, it's nonstop. But the cameras shouldn't have picked them up or no? Yeah, the cameras find nothing. And Ed, this is the kind of husband Ed is, so that Ruth can sleep, he would often go sleep, go not sleep, but go in the backyard with his shotgun and stand guard. I feel so bad for them. I hate this guy. Hope he comes to a bad ending. So the police are honestly putting a ton of work into this. They've got, I mean, they're really trying. They, they've, you know, they've got sketches of this guy, like you said, while well, you asked earlier if they did that, they've got sketches of this guy. They've got cameras. Cameras. They've got total surveillance. They are offering as much protection as possible. I mean, they're really, really trying to catch this guy, partly because they think it might be associated with this serial killer that's on yeah. the loose. And, and also just because this is scary as I'll get out. And they're trying to <laughs> they're trying to find out who is doing this. So they just are they're going above and beyond. And then the chief um, of police, he's not really involved in the investigation, right? He delegates it. He has yeah, detectives on the case. So he's, he knows about it, of course, but he's not actively involved in the investigation. But then a letter arrives 
and his wife is mentioned in it. No. So he says, okay, that's enough. Roll up the sleeves. Chief's coming in, baby. Yeah, so he takes the file and he goes home and locks himself in a room and spends hours poring over every single letter in that file. He's like, this is ridiculous. Yep. And within 24 hours, he goes back to the station and he assembles a small secret team. And he says, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put the Finleys under surveillance and we're not going to tell them because obviously somebody, like he's, as soon as we had cameras in the backyard, things started happening in the front yard. So Uh, maybe somehow that information's getting leaked, right? He's like, I have a theory, but I want to test it. So we're going to, we're going to survey the Finleys and we're going to see what happens. So they have a helicopter on the Finleys and they have police tails. I mean, wouldn't that be kind of obvious? So I'm trying to imagine like what kind of neighborhood they are. Like probably like a suburban middle class white picket fence neighborhood. Probably. I, yeah. I mean, if I see a helicopter, I've never once thought, oh, they're watching me. No, I know. But like we've also <laughs> been in like really urban place. Like, you know, when we lived in LA, helicopters were so it was an everyday occurrence. But like yeah. here, I'm in I'm in the suburbs here and I when I see a helicopter I'm like somebody's getting flown to a hospital anyways but if the helicopter was high enough too it's probably just to keep a spot on where the car goes so they can tell the people on the ground it's probably not just hovering over it hoping to see things yeah right it's probably just (laughs) with binoculars yeah it's probably just like turning right on main street you know right that's probably how it's working yeah (laughs) so A few days into the surveillance, the Finleys are out running errands and they pull over to to one of those blue post office box boxes Mm -hmm. and Ruth puts a bunch of mail in and they move along. It takes a while for the tail to catch up. But when the tail catches up, it opens it has the uh, USPS open the thing and they take the letters out before their mail to see what's in there. There is a personal letter, there's a bill, and there are two letters from the poet. So they think, okay, was the poet following Ruth that closely and we missed it? So they do it again. They follow again for a couple of days. And again, Ruth mails letters. Some are from the poet. Wait, 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 wait. And the chief has his suspicions confirmed. He believed that it was either Ed or Ruth were the poet. What? My mind is blown right now. So the chief brings Ed in to see if he's involved. And Ed is just shocked beyond all shock. Is totally seems genuine reaction. He agrees to a polygraph, whatever they want to do. He passes it with flying colors. And he they tell him, we think Ruth is the poet. Whoa. She got stabbed three times. Yeah. Yeah. What? I I I don't even know. So they search Ruth's office and they find evidence that they can't ignore. Things like the a letter that was delivered that was torn, the exact the exact torn piece is in Ruth's uh notebook. Like they match identically. Like she clearly ripped it out. There's a book of poems, there's pencils, pens that match, pieces of red bandana. What? What? I don't I don't understand. So Ed's initial reaction, honestly, he's not even mad. He's just relieved that his wife is safe. Okay, but she's working with somebody and she got stabbed still. The police confront Ruth. And she doesn't honest honest to God doesn't really have any memory of any of this. What? And so they check Ruth into a psychiatric ward to observe her and keep her safe. And the investigation costs the police close to $400,000, but they decide not to press charges because Ruth is in intensive therapy and the therapist honestly believes that Ruth has no memory of these actions. Like she has a split personality or something? They believe she was having a dissociative identity uh, uh, episode, so DID, dissociative identity disorder. And through therapy, it's discovered that... 
Ruth had actually been severely abused as a child by a neighbor mm. who used a red bandana Bubba. to tie her up. And she had no memory of that either. She had blocked it out. She and, blocked it out. And so, I mean, this is just, I mean, Ruth is confused as all get out. She doesn't remember it, but there are so many things that they're showing her, like it's coming from her notebook. That it's, adds up. She, like you said, these you said it before. You said these abductors don't make any sense. They don't because they doesn't make they don't make sense. Like why would you drive somebody around for four hours and not hurt, not do something, and then you're like <laughs> right. yelling through the woods for them? And they they went to the scene and they only found Ruth's footprints. There was nobody else. What? Yeah, I mean, this is so How much can to the unpack brain. Here. Do this? That's isn't cr- it like, unbelievable? It's just crazy that the brain can do something like that. So, a couple things I want to talk about. What I want to talk about DID a little bit because it's so fascinating. It's really rare; only between one and two percent of the population live with this disorder. And Hollywood has done a job of making DID seem like your other part is you know a serial killer and the other part doesn't know it really villainous yeah which is the story doesn't help not the case and this story doesn't help either this is so (laughs) unusual this is so unusual but ruth was ruth was never hurting anybody else i mean she really wasn't even except herself ruth was never hurting another person now there is a show that came out in 2019 called Many Sides of Jane, and it follows a woman with DID, and it's fascinating to watch if Is you're it interested. fictional? No, it's real. She, It's oh. a reality show, and it follows her. She has several different parts, and it's interesting because lots of times she's conscious of the other parts coming forward. That's what she calls them, the, her parts. They come forward, and she knows, and she remembers, but there are certain parts where she also has dissociative amnesia from it. So there's one part in particular when that part takes control, she doesn't remember anything. But that part is never dangerous. That part just does okay. different things. Just like does she doesn't things. remember going to the store. <laughs> so. That's one of the main things she wants. Why she agreed to do the show. She said, I want people to understand that people with DID are not dangerous. Just not just stabbing everybody on their other parts. Yeah, this is, we try to work together with my other parts. I try to understand it. And it's almost always, always, always stems from severe childhood abuse and trauma. And it's something that the brain creates. You're trying to like, yeah, to protect you. Like extreme compartmentalization. Exactly. Like extreme. Like exactly. I need to put this away because it's so fucking painful. Exactly. That's how Jane describes it. And it's going to shatter and, and create different stuff. She says it's like she has boxes in her head. Yeah. Yeah. And I some of the parts know about the abuse and they have that. And then the other parts don't know about it. It's to keep I them just safe. give them hugs. Uh, yeah. And so this, so Ruth's situation is really different in the fact that there's just one other part and it's right. she has absolutely no memory of it and it's a vi- uh, you know a self harming part that's yeah. un- that's unusual but people with the idea are at high risk high risk for self harm and yeah. treatment is psychotherapy and medication like antidepressants because as you can imagine there's a whole slew of things that come along with it like anxiety <laughs> Or depression right. because you don't know who's what part's going to show up and when. Oh and you God, lose gaps in time. It's hard to be consistent. It's really fascinating to watch. I recommend it. I think even you would like it. It's not scary. Really? Because Jane has two children. And yeah. she never knows who, who's going to come forward. And so all of her parts take good care of her children. And their main goal is to keep them safe. Stop. But if she has the part come forward where she has amnesia... And like she d- she doesn't remember what has happened. Like when her son had a bandage on his arm and she came back to being herself and she had no memory of what had happened and the other part had, you know, wrapped it and taken care of it. But she was worried and scared. And so she has to set reminders and notes and have, you know, like a whiteboard with everything on it so that all of her mm-hmm. parts know what has to be done and when it has to be done. I have so many questions specifically about Ruth's stuff. Like, like, for example, when they were all watching a Christmas movie, who set the wreath on fire? Yes. Okay. So that's the part that's so I fascinating. There's somebody else. Yes. Yes. That's what Ruth says. And so Ruth was actually on Oprah. 
and Oprah w- at one no point way. and did an interview on Oprah and Early she says Oprah. the same thing. She said through years of therapy, it she she says she finally does remember stabbing herself, but it took years to recover that. And she said she Jesus. just kept telling herself she had to do it, and she doesn't. She thinks so. What she thinks happened, what Ruth thinks happened, is that she had repressed the childhood trauma. Plus, she says that attack at sixteen was also true. Those and she probably th- those didn't work two through things that either. happened. And in 1977, when when Ed had his suspected heart attack, plus the BTK it. strangler is <gasps> alive. Yeah, I was She's home like, alone. After what? period of time like I wondered if maybe that first letter was some a a real person or like yeah like what triggered her going back into this state so she said that triggered it and she started started to bring up things for her because of everything that was going on and also she said she thought she thinks that she started her other part started acting out to it really to keep her safe to let the police take it seriously to get police presence, to get police surveillance, hmm. to keep her safe because she was so scared from everything that had happened to her before. And she said there she said there are parts of it I did not do. Like she said there really was a man on the street who approached me. Yeah. I, I didn't make that, that like up. The whole wreath thing. Yeah, she said I didn't set the they wreath were, on fire. I was in was the down basement. In the, in the, yeah. Yeah. So there are things that she didn't do. And she said, and I don't remember doing all of it. She said, I, I believe I probably did certain things like the yeah. like the urine and the feces and the yeah, Molotov gross. cocktails. But she said, I didn't set the fire. I couldn't have. I was with Ed in the in the basement. And exactly. That's what I keep thinking she, of. So that's another thing she that she stabbed thinks, herself three times. I know. And they had said originally that it was not medically or medically it was not physically possible for her to have done it because the kidney no it was in the back she stabbed herself in the back oh god that's some good shoulder mobility oh man so there she said she thinks that there was a man that accosted her on the street and that also triggered it that escalated the behavior so all of those there yeah i wonder if she wasn't getting harassed a little bit i think there was something because there's some things that like, okay, you don't remember things, but you still did them. But okay, it's physically impossible for you to have been there and do them is another thing. Yeah. So there was – and who knows? When something like this is crazy, people are so mean. Like it could have been a high yeah. school kid or some jerk yeah. who set yeah, the yeah, wreath yeah, on yeah. fire. Like we'll that's scare her. Yeah. So who knows? God, but That's just – I just – and it, think about Ed – who I guess never noticed these things happening, right? He never noticed that she was doing certain stuff. Well, and it she, always happened. I assume she was doing it from his at work, work right? or she was mailing the letters underneath the stack. And and she's the brain is so amazing. It doesn't want Ruth to know either, right? <laughs> so just, it's like it's just so crazy to think about. So it's protecting both Ruth and Ed from knowing. Yeah. And wow, I mean it's it's unbelievable. Ed and her kids stood by her and one hundred percent said she didn't know. No, there's no way. They stood by her. She did years of therapy. Yeah, I was wondering how her kids handled it too. They said there's no way that she made it up that that was she was having a, a dissociative Those identity episodes. episode. Was um were there any reports of her like being weird at work or no? No, I mean that's the that's the thing. She was everybody described her as just the nicest woman. Just really nice. Her and Ed were super friendly. Yeah. Just nice, solid people. And it was that's so what it sound like. Scary. I mean, she is. That's what she was. And then this other yeah. part of her just acting out and acting up so when these things triggered it. Wow. Wow. Ruth went through therapy and did her best to put this behind her. And you know, she just felt terrible and embarrassed and she said of course you know some people didn't talk to her after that and but yeah. a lot of people did she she did interviews on, and, and explained it as best she could and a lot of people actually believed her and understood that's cool she had no i mean it's not her fault i mean it <sighs> right it's a brain trying to protect her from trauma yeah i mean we we could i would be willing <laughs> to blame trauma her abusers. literally changes the the brain yeah this is this is these are this is the ugly side of 
healing. You know, she was abused on two separate occasions. Like some disgusting jerk took advantage of a three-year-old. That's how old she was the first time. And then a 16-year-old. Hope they died painful deaths. And this is what her brain did to keep her safe and protect her. Yeah. yeah, And again, her case is unusual. DID is not usually this kind of sensational. Yeah, but it's right. so fascinating. It's just the and, factors that were going on at the time with the yeah. serial killer. And stuff Anybody too. living with DID, like, oh, it's it, it it sounds so challenging, and they deserve so much credit. Right? Imagine, like, we think life is hard. Yeah. Imagine having to handle all the parts coming in and out. Yeah, and and you know, I was telling you, you know, I had brain fog from COVID, and it was so scary to not remember you texting yeah. me. That's their life all the time. You know, they right different parts, you know, Jane in that series was saying sometimes she'd wake up and end up in another house and she's like, I don't remember oh agreeing God. to this or or knowing where I was, you know, or yeah. She'd right. wake she'd come to somewhere else. That's Jane so would come back scary. to the front and she'd be in a store that she doesn't remember going into. Wow. Ruth and Ed stayed together. Ed died in 2011. Mm. Ruth died in 2019 at the age of 89. Wow. Good. I'm glad they – that's a good ending. An unbelievable story. It's amazing what your brain will do. And I presented it like that because Ruth believed at every point that this was happening to her. Her terror and her fear was real. I want to congratulate you because you (laughs) did it so well, like I, I feel like this is the most my mind has ever been blown in one of these stories. Like I was, that was like a twist. I was not expecting at all. That was really good. Well, that's that because good. you know I have the advantage of you never knowing any true crime things that ever happened. <laughs> so most people might know this story before it starts. But so that's cool. how it was for Ruth. Like she truly thought all these things were right. happening. Can you imagine having to go back to work after you felt like you were abducted by two guys on the street and? Or, you know, your life was threatened, and really, it was just you driving around for four hours, and you don't know it. It's so scary. It's so scary. A lot of even the police officers, a lot of them felt like felt for Ruth, even though they'd yeah. you know had wasted wasted I'm yeah. air quotes their time and their money. Like they tr- believed a lot of them believed Ruth too. Like they had seen her. That's cool and though. They knew like this is something else. This is not just somebody trying to get attention or anything like that. the chief figured it out. The chief figured it out when his wife was threatened. Is it because – so do you think Ruth mentioned his wife because she wanted – or that part of her brain wanted him to figure it out? I'm not sure. And get involved? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how – I don't know if that that part of her was wanting to just keep going or if that part of her was some sort of secret cry for help. Right. Like as it escalated, could get more dangerous and dangerous. Yeah. And that's how he figured it out because he thought it was so strange. Why would anybody mention my wife? Right. That's and odd. Like and then completely dissociated from the situation. Yeah. And then the letters always stopped when the Finleys were on vacation. Things like I, little that things like that. The weird part is like, did the serial killer get busy? Like, oh, yeah. really stressed at work or like, oh, I ran out of pencils, whatever. Yeah. I mean, Ruth and Ed are so likable. Yeah. And so nice and sweet. And it's just so sad that they had to go through that. Yeah. But I'm glad they finally figured it out and Ruth was Me brave too. enough to get help. I mean, that's really. Yeah, that's hard facing that. Can you yeah. imagine? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. You don't, it finally ends. So you've had this reign of terror for years and you've been feeling it, experiencing it as if it is happening. And then you have to take the blame for all of it and you're embarrassed and you're ashamed Mm -hmm. and she pushed through and went and got help and did years of therapy and right like going facing that trauma I mean that's that's really that's a lot that's you have to be really brave to do that I'll stand by it Ruth is a fighter in all aspects right she fought when she was 16 and she just kept on fighting just in different ways even if it's against her own brain who's trying to save her from the trauma. <laughs> right. I mean that that takes a lot of courage to to get help oh, and, yeah. and stay in the same town yeah. and live your life. So that is the wow. story of the poet who is Ruth. That Finley. was wild. There you go. That was a really good story. I'm really glad it ended well too. 
Yeah, that's why I didn't think I'd have to earmuff you because I knew it would unscare you at the end, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> there were talk of other serial killers. I was trying to keep it keep it light. For <laughs> uh, how'd your tea hold up? How'd your two thumbs oh, tea hold up? It is still two thumbing. It's great. I'm just, <laughs> I just vibe it. It's in good mood. Listening to this crazy story. It's good stuff. Thanks, special listener. <laughs> Talk about <laughs> terrifying. That's the voice I imagine poor Ruth heard on the phone for oh, God's sakes. No. Terrifying. Uh, all right. Well, we actually had a story recommendation, so I will try to bring that to you yeah. next time. Thank you for sending that in. Other yes. special listener. Okay. I'm <laughs> going to come up with new names. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on researching it and hopefully have it ready for next week. Cool. Alana's gonna love it. Yes. Yeah, don't research it because you saw that you saw the request. So I didn't. I just looked it up. Don't to like. I just just briefly. No, do not look it up. I looked it up briefly. I didn't. I I just remember the name. That's it. I'm good at compartmentalizing too. No, no, I don't think. But not to, to that degree. Yikes. To that level. Well, hopefully. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram at Tea Time Crimes. We've been posting lots of fun stuff like alleyways and puppies. That sounded weird, <laughs> yeah. but. <laughs> yeah, the puppies, <laughs> the puppies meeting. And you can email us at Tea Time Crimes at gmail.com. We've already gotten lots of tea recommendations, a story recommendation. Keep them coming. We love to hear from you. We Please do. tell your friends, your family, your enemies, your lovers, all of the above. It really helps. We found that um, word of mouth has done a lot for us. Okay, this is getting a little weird. You know, Sorry. Just spread you, the word. You okay? just start naming relationships at the end of every podcast. Like, just tell people, guys. Just rate, review, <laughs> subscribe, and tell people. A lot is going to go helpful. through. Your second cousin once removed. Um, your <laughs> carpenter. Your pharmacist. Your carpenter. <laughs> You just start naming weird oh. associations. Yeah. Tell people. Tell Peace the out. people. All right. We hope to be back next week, God willing. Yes. And oh. the isolation needs to end at this house. <laughs> oh, golly. All right. Thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. Ooh, rather than hot there. Mm.